So to start off, um, we wanted to introduce uh, us first. Um, Tina Koto, um, no Tiamana o Kitipuna, no Poneke Aho e Nohana, he pu kenga um, Aho uh, ite Matai Hinengaro Ote Heringawaka. Uh, ko Hedwig Eisma Tokunga. Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. My name is Hed Geisenberg. I'm a lecturer at the School of Psychology at Te Rangawaka. Um, originally from Germany and um, was lucky to have been moving to New Zealand five years ago only and to now be part of the uh, School of Psychology with lovely colleagues um, and um, amazing students <laughs> here and some of them here. Um, yeah, and I'm a, it's my pleasure to um, be here with Erika Tehili. So, uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name's Erica. Um, as Hedwig said, I um, first met her. Uh, when I returned as an older student to study um, and at the time I was working for corrections and I was lucky because corrections decided that they needed more psychologists, who would know why, um, and they offered to, to um, send some of us off to train. So, um, so I was one of their first scholarship students. I'd already studied psychology and my work um, in the prison really had way, raised a lot of questions for me around what happens in terms of treatment and rehabilitation in the prison. So it was pretty easy going to university and, and having some idea that whatever I was going to study, I really wanted it to benefit the people um, that I had been working with. So um, I got chatting to Hedwig. I tapped in her office and asked her if she would supervise me. And you'd not long arrived, really, had you? Mm. Um, and one of the things that I said was, well, that Hedwig would know is that I'm very passionate about um, the role that trauma plays in people's um, trajectory in life, and particularly when that, when part of that traje trajectory inter interacts with the um, correctional system. So, uh, you know, I said that's what I want to study. That's what I want to know more. It's what everyone needs to know more about. And um, and I really hope that after we do this little bit of research, because it was a master's and not a PhD that it carries on, and I'm really um, grateful to know that Hedwig has kept that going, along with some of her great students, so um, on would it go. So if anyone's interested in research, speak to Hedwig at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think I'm going to start, oh, this thing, isn't it? I don't do much of this anymore, so I might, oh, okay. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist in the Department of Corrections, um, and that takes on sort of a number of different guises. So just briefly, the bulk of psychologists in the Department of Corrections are employed in what we call psychological services. Um, and that's, I think, around 200 psychologists, clinical psychologists and general practice psychologists work um, for the department. And they work, and this is where I was working, um, specifically targeting rehabilitation and offending behaviour. So it's not so much around mental health, although, of course, those, those things cross over, but it is about how do we help somebody to, um, to make some real changes in their lives. And that occurs in a couple of different ways. It, it occurs through psych services, um, psychologists that are based in predominantly around the country in community probation centres. Um, and they'll work with people in the community, but they'll also go into the prisons and do individual-based work there. A lot of assessment work, including assessment for parole boards um, and, and, um, and some treatment work as well. Um, but the demand is high, so um, it's the psych services, as we like to call it, that, um, that, that do that work. And they also offer group treatment programs, special treatment programs, and I'll talk about one of the units that I used to work in, um, probably next, actually. So I'll just have a look. Oh, yes. So they, um, they operate um, special treatment units around the country. There are six special treatment units. Two of them are for sex offenders. Um, and then they have four for, as a special treatment unit for violent offenders. So the one at Rimataka Prison is called Te Whare Manakitanga. It's approximately seven or eight months to a year, sometimes longer, depending on the person that's there and, and how long they've got to go on their sentence. Um, and I worked in Te Whare Manakitanga for about, 
I think three or four years, went and studied, and then went back for a year. Um, and so I just threw a couple of things up on the board that I think were, were particularly interesting to me. Now, the top picture I like to bring because it's perhaps what somebody wouldn't expect to see if they were looking at a photo of men in one of the units that technically caters to the most violent offenders in our country. And they're dressed in tutus. And I have great joy going around the prison talking to people, uh, talking to men about the potential of doing a program like this one and saying to them, but you'll get to do ballet. Just, just for the reaction, which is generally like, oh, I don't think so. Um, but actually, <laughs> nine times out of ten, uh, they do embrace it. I'm, I'm pretty sure the fact that the tutors that come from the New Zealand Ballet Company, actually, you know, they're, they're probably... Um, spending time with them is probably a big incentive, but nonetheless, I think they gain a whole appreciation for their work and their exercise and their strength and fitness that goes into being ballet dancers. So... Um, so, in Te Whare Manakitanga, alongside of the treatment that they're there to do, um, the staff there are also looking to provide other opportunities to have experiences that may not have been a normal part of people's lives prior to coming to prison. And so that can include something like this high tea. You can see the little cupcakes sandwiches there. And there aren't many men um, that come through the violent offender units who have had an opportunity to do something like a high tea with this tiered plates. Um, and that particular high tea was conducted to raise funds for the New Zealand Cancer Society, um, of which a lot of the men had Fano members um, that had been affected by cancer, therefore were very keen to be a part of that um, high tea. Some of them served all of the guests that came. People had to pay for tickets, and we charged a lot too. And that was because it was all going to a good cause. And then some of the men just participated and learned what it was like to eat tiny little triangle sandwiches. And, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, but those sort of seemingly simple things, um, they're hard to organise, but they're very, very valuable in terms of um, giving people access to different experiences. Um, and then the other thing I took from Te Whare Manakitanga that I wanted to share was from one of the newsletters that came out from the unit, which is, uh, I've put in the square there, the quote, that I, um, I think someone had asked the men what was their greatest learning while they are at Te Whare Manakitanga, and um, that was what they said, and it was very appropriate to the topic today, so so I threw it on there. <laughs> but it sort of, as a whole, kind of encapsulates what a place like Te Whare Manakitanga can do um, when it's operating at its best. So I was lucky to work there um, for quite some time under psych services and then spent a year in Palmerston North working at Wanganui Prison, Manawatu Prison and in the community for a year um, in Palmerston North and then returned back to Rimataka Prison but to a different role this year. Um, and it still astonishes me, I think I was saying before the talk began, it still astonishes me enormously that mental health, the provision of mental health services is relatively recent, at least locally in the prisons. I couldn't say over the whole country when mental health services might have started to be provided. I think it, became, it began with something called improving mental health or IMH services. Um, and so it started at different times at different places. But in terms of having a a team that specifically works on mental health difficulties that arise in the prison. Our team has been at Wimataka for two and a half years. Two and a half years. It's, it's astonishing. So it's a, it comes under health, so it's separate from psych services, which probably doesn't mean much to most people. But for me, it's great, because I no longer have to always be thinking, OK, how do we work on your offending? Although, again, of course, these things cross over. And it, my, all, my only job is, is how can I best support you to get through whatever it is you're getting through at the moment or trying to get through at the moment. So the ISPT teams, the intervention support and prevention teams, are multidisciplinary teams that were set up. Um, and at the moment, they're based in seven prisons around the country. Um, and the focus, our greatest focus, is on suicidality and self-harm um, and the potential for self-harm, of which the numbers are enormous. Um, now I work at Rimataka Prison and also one day a week at Arohata Prison. And we've long known that those things were um, particularly prevalent in the women's prisons, but they are just as prevalent in the men's prisons. So that's our, um, that's our siren, I guess you might say, that if we get an email or a referral where it's indicated that the person might have been talking about um, having some suicidal ideation or engaging in self-harming behaviours, um, we will try and get there very, very quickly. But we can be called for any kind of mental health crisis in the prison. 
Um, for people who are very acute, then they are housed um, for anything up to two or three weeks in our um, ISU um, or our intervention and support unit. And that's um, it's a place that, that perhaps at its best could function as a respite, but given difficulties with resources and things, it generally is a place where people are watching, you know, all of the time. So, I mean, I guess it prevents um, self-harm and suicidality just because there's always somebody watching. People can be on 10-minute observations and be looked at every 10 minutes just to make sure that they haven't, um, that they haven't decided to take their own life. So, um, yeah, so outside of the ISUs, we work right around the prison, like I said, with in, anything from um, depression to anxiety, a lot of personality disorders. I'm sort of going to say that in inverted quotes. I shouldn't because I'm a clinical psychologist, but I did see a, um, a trainer, um, a very well-experienced person doing some um, training on, on working with trauma, and he said, what is a personality disorder but an ingrained a way of coping with trauma. And I think my experience would say that that is absolutely correct. The different ways that it shows up are ingrained ways that people survive some pretty horrific circumstances. So, yeah, I, I work in a multidisciplinary team, ISPT team. There are four of us. And if you know anything about the prison, there are between eight and, eight and 900 men um, in the prison as a muster on any given day. So four people to sort of try and have some sort of handle on the mental health issues of the entire prison population can be tricky, but we don't just do it on our own because we have, we're a referral service as well. So I mentioned improving mental health earlier. Um, they are a very experienced group of counsellors that we can refer people who are fairly straightforward, so not complex kind of cases. Maybe if there is such a thing, a simple case of depression, of course it doesn't tend to work out that way in real life. But we refer them on to IMH to have counselling. And then at the higher end of, of acute risk or acute experience of mental health difficulty, we're, we're working with forensics and, and referring to them. And we also tend to hold prisoners because, like the prison, um, forensics beds are hard to come by. And, um, yeah, and people who probably need to be in a forensics unit are uh, often waiting quite some time to actually get a bed. Um, so that's at the very acute end. We sort of try and work with the people in the middle, but it's a very big middle. Um, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> so um, I just wanted to round off, I guess, what I consider sort of this introduction to the way psychologists work in prisons, but also how we the various ways in which we might interact with people who have a history of, of trauma by sharing a story um, of, a, of a man that I will call Chase, and he gave me permission to, to, to share the story. Um, and it was a story that struck me because he was a great storyteller. I like to think that I'm at least descended from some good storytellers, so I'll do my best to give his story some uh, the honour it's due. Um, I spoke to Chase about four weeks ago, um, <clears throat> we had been asked to go and see him because he'd been feeling pretty low. He's based in the high-medium units, so um, they're on the 23-hour-a-day lockups. Um, they haven't had visitors in the prison for, I think, three years, Rimutuka Prison. Um, and he was really wanting some help. And he, when I asked him why, um, why now and, and what has... has um, the word inspired you, I guess, to kind of put your hand up because it's not something he said that he's done often in his life. He told me the story about when he was on the outside. Um, he was in prison for a domestic violence incident against his partner and he was very honest about his responsibility for his anger and how that played out in his relationship. But when he was telling me the story, he said that his, his partner and, and himself had, um, had words, had more than words, everything had gone badly and he'd ended up walking out of the house and going and sitting out in the backyard. Um, and I think it was around lunchtime, but he was still sitting out in the backyard on his own by about seven o'clock in the evening. And so his partner had tried to coax him back into the house. He wouldn't come. And so she rang his friend and he said, you really need to come see Chase. He's outside, he won't come in, I don't know what to do. So his friend kind of bowls on over and walks up to Chase sitting in the backyard and says, hey, bro, what's happening? And uh, Chase just sat there. He said he didn't look at him. He just shook his, kept shaking his head, and he said, 
I am just so angry all of the time. I hate everything. I hate everyone. I even hate you. And so the guy was just kind of like rocking back and forth on his heels. Um, and he said, the worst thing, the very worst thing is that I have no idea why. And um, his friend was standing there and there was silence for a little bit and then his friend said to him, I think I know why, bro. And um, Chase sort of looked, looked up and looked at him in a bit of surprise and he said his friend literally took a few steps backward and said, childhood trauma! And he ran, like just literally ran. <laughs> and Chase said he got up and he ran after him, chased him for two blocks. <laughs> Finally got hold of him. And when he did get hold of me, he said to him, bro, why are you running away? And he said, because I'm scared of you, bro. We all are. And that was the moment where he knew something needed to change. So he didn't mind what it was he did, how long he would have to do it for. He was just determined that he needed to figure this out, this anger, this hatred, this thing that he couldn't quite name, but that was having such a devastating impact on his life. Um, so he is kind of where I'll leave my part of this and come back later to talk about some research and hand over to Hedwig to contextualise the life of Chase and others like him. But I think it's quite a um, good uh, example of this, um, what we probably sometimes don't think about, this relationship between people who are on the offending side, who commit um, crimes, that they actually oftentimes potentially realize what's going on, potentially, potentially not can, cannot place it properly. And then um, when it then comes to this, um, to an, another outburst of, of, um, of anger, maybe in this case, um, there is little to think about where that's coming from because it's all about this current situation only. And so um, understanding this a little bit better, why that is and how these things relate, um, is something that, um, yeah, definitely it's, was inspired by Erica coming into the office a couple of years ago. Um, so when we think about um, childhood trauma and imprisonment, um, there is um, there are correlational studies, and there's a, quite a lot of um, knowledge that some people or that there is a relationship between those two things. So, uh, and um, media often misportrayed in a in a in a bad way, but um, the relationship with anything that has to do with imprisonment, anything that has to do with a um, uh, decrease in abilities to function in the society or in relationships. Um, um, is, seems to be prevalent, um, and also any sort of problems leaving, leaving a situation, whichever that is. Um, when we think about those relationships, and I said um, um, just a moment ago, correlation, so that means that we kind of so oftentimes think of looking at two things at the same time and just see, do they occur at the same time? Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they are causally linked so what um, we need to, or what we can do to look at these um, relationships here, for example, is we can go to a prison population and can actually examine and ask people, um, did you experience any sort of um, childhood uh, trauma or childhood maltreatment? And then we can measure how many people out of this population, if we go to one prison or to a pop greater population, how many of those experience that. And we can derive some numbers. So this is actually from um, Erica's work. This, these are actually quite high numbers. And you see also that the range is quite large because it varies quite a lot which type of prison and uh, country you go to. But in, in this case, this is, these are two New Zealand numbers from different studies, uh, different places, um, but we can then derive how many of those people would, at the moment that they are in prison, report that they experienced maltreatment when they were younger. So there is a couple of issues with that. In some ways, you could say, well, retrospectively thinking about that. So there, and another way to look at that um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a way that um, lets us think about it more in also causal relationships is going to the general population. So there, if you just go and ask uh, people in, in a representative sample of the general population who did experience, or we actually track if they experienced traumatic events during childhood, and then we follow them up over the years later on um, and 
um, and see who of those people committed an offense, who showed antisocial behavior, um, who showed that not only once but more persistently potentially. And as you probably are all aware of, New Zealand is rich of many longitudinal studies and uh, the one that we can draw on for this kind of topic most on is the Dunedin Longitudinal Risk Study. And there, um, for example, um, you can, they looked at persistent uh, criminal behavior and what they found is that um, maltreatment was experienced in 28% of those with persistent uh, criminal behavior whereas those with a low risk of criminal behavior, they only experienced maltreatment um, um, to, um, in 5% of them did, that, did experience that. So you see there is a difference there in terms of, there's a relationship there, but you also see it's not 100%, of course. So it's not like every person who experiences maltreatment in any ways will move, go on and um, show some sort of antisocial behavior. Uh, the other thing is, uh, other numbers, um, this is from a, U a US uh, American sample, um, uh, is that there's a almost two, point, two uh, times higher number of arrests in individuals experiencing childhood adversity in adulthood than in those who did not um, experience that. So this, while this lower panel here is some way of getting a better idea of, of potential causal links and trajectories, which is quite interesting. Um, we oftentimes study uh, and look into prison populations because we have, there's a higher prevalence already, so we can actually go and, and look at th those specific um, constellations. Plus, um, it's also interesting to see how that plays out in this, in this current situation uh, where somebody is in a more um, intense um, living situation, also in, in prison, for example. Um, so when we look at these relationships, we also not want to, uh, ah, now we know, well, there's a higher risk, so what? We want to also understand um, the mechanisms. So why is that? Because only if we understand why is it actually that some, for some people, not for all of them, but for some people, there's a development and there's a higher risk for showing antisocial behavior uh, after such experiences, why is that? What are the mechanisms? Because then we cannot only, of course, we want to reduce maltreatment in the first place, but we can probably also work on what we can do to help people on the way to not develop this behavior. So um, when we think about potential mechanisms, um, let's just have a look what are those, um, how can we describe these two phenomena that we're putting here next to each other? So childhood maltreatment, and you'll, you heard us already using different words there, and this whole literature is quite wide, um, quite varied in the ways of uh, terminology. Childhood maltreatment, childhood trauma, early life adversity, early life um, um, uh, trauma. There are different words that capture also different things. So we need to always, for each study that is published out there, always look how did they operationalize it, what did they actually ask and measure. Many of, uh, a lot of the literature actually focuses on uh, physical abuse and uh, sexual abuse. Um, some uh, include also uh, physical um, neglect and emotional neglect and emotional abuse. Um, but this is, um, this is then already getting a little bit broader. Some studies even include things like state care or um, other adversity in childhood that can be also low socioeconomic status um, and other um, um, parental uh, problems, um, but the, 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 the focused, more focused research really talks about um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect. When we think about those, um, those kind of situations, things that people can, a young person can experience, you can already, and when we think about what could be mechanisms, you can think about things that come to mind immediately, like, well, if I experience this maltreatment from a person maybe if it's, if it's a person that I know, somebody I trust, I learn to actually basically not trust that person. So there might be some things that go on in, on terms, in terms of cognitive mechanisms. There's also something you can imagine somebody as a child who experiences these kind of um, situations uh, would experience a lot of anxiety in that moment. And our body is very good in learning quite quickly from, from, from fearful situations. And so we can also imagine how that actually impacts the way that the brain works and the brain and our body reacts to stressful situations. 
And this is kind of reflected in what we see then when in the symptoms in adulthood. So the, the huge literature that is there talking about broader symptoms and effects of childhood maltreatment lists a whole bunch of um, symptoms that can show up. So depression, anxiety, so this is what we call internalizing symptoms, um, uh, PTSD in some ways, um, but also aggression. It also uh, affects on cognitive functioning um, and also um, things like personality. And that's uh, coming back to what you just said earlier. So there's um, there's a lot of there are a lot of effects here where we can already see. Well, there might be some mechanisms that come through these experiences on a cognitive side, maybe through some sort of the per the way that personality changes, or also the way that the body actually functions. And um, what we do know is that childhood maltreatment does lead to um, higher alertness, um, more um, stress, um, like a different way of reacting to everyday stressors as well, um, a different way that the body um, works in terms of, for example, things like heart rate variability. This is a, 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 almost a measure of how resilient a body is, and therefore also the brain. And um, what we call this overall, or can call this, is uh, over-arousal. So people who experience childhood maltreatment tend to show um, a higher um, alertness. And um, PTSD as post-traumatic stress disorder is listed here as one of, one of the ways that we can potentially grasp that with, if we want to, with a diagnostic uh, uh, entity. Um, and on the other hand side, what we also know is that childhood maltreatment also leads to, or can lead to, maladaptive personality traits. What do we mean with those? Um, maladaptive because they're not helpful for a person to, um, um, to function in, in, in the social context. And these are um, borderline personality traits, um, these are um, um, antisocial personality traits, uh, also um, psychopathic personality traits, um, histrionic personality characteristics that are um, leading to a lot of interpersonal problems. Coming back to this anger, this, the way that somebody is perceiving other people and the, the way they, they are perceived because of the way they interact. So this dysfunctionality in interpersonal interactions, and again, you can see already, well, that's not too far from being aggressive or running into problems um, and um, potentially committing crimes that are related to uh, other people. And uh, last but not least, what we also know is that maladaptive personality traits actually have a, a link to treatment progress. And so now we're going to move into this thing of this not only leads to behavior that is uh, antisocial, but on top of things, and this is actually what brought Erica also uh, uh, to this topic, there is um, that can cause problems the way, in the way that people can follow treatment potentially. That was at least our question because we know this from a lot that the bulk of the research in this area has been on uh, borderline personality traits where um, treatment uh, progress is oftentimes quite um, difficult, takes long, takes um, um, longer time, periods of time that uh, people need to be in treatment um, and can be much more of a roller coaster. Um, in comparison to some other um, contexts. And so for that reason, um, we thought that this might be actually something that might apply here too. And it, um, problems in treatment progress can mean um, getting into trouble during the treatment with other clients uh, in a group context, um, not knowing where they go and just dropping out um, and just not completing the treatment. Um, and so bringing those three angles together, we were sitting there like thinking, oh, maybe we need to just look at this relationship between how people actually are able to follow a treatment pro program like the one that Erica was um, working in um, based on or depending on what type of experiences they had in the past. I'm going to back to you. Oh, yes, please. Um, so... On the ground, you know, you can have this idea that you want to know more about trauma and, and, the, and how much trauma there is in the prison, because anecdotally you know, anyone who's been into a prison, spoken with people in that environment, know that a lot of the people that we work with have a lot of adversity in their backgrounds. Um, 
And <clears throat> it's a tricky area to study because when you want to know about somebody's trauma, how do you find that out? Do you send some researchers into a prison and sit down with men or women, um, they don't know you, you don't know them, and in this one-off situation, you ask them questions about the things that Hedwig had on the board earlier. You know, there's a lot of issues with doing something like that. Ethically, there's a huge amount of issues that you would go in and gather that kind of information and walk out the door with it under your arm <clears throat> and leaving the person there to mull over the things that they've perhaps talked about, if they've talked about it. Um, so there was a lot of thought that went into actually capturing um, capturing the levels of um, maltreatment, again, picking up on what Hedwig's, Hedwig was saying, we tend to use words interchangeably, um, that people might have experienced. And that was where the idea came to focus on the STU programs, the STU violence programs. And that's because, one, um, the, it's, a, it's a therapeutic program, it's a treatment program. The men that are there are there for a significant period of time, and over that time they will build up a relationship, hopefully, with the people that are providing the treatment. And in the context of that relationship, there is information that's gathered in order to write treatment reports and things at the end. So the information that we needed is already gathered, which means there is no having to worry about going in and asking really um, questionable questions of this very vulnerable group of people. So um, we decided to do it that way. And of course, there are great things about that, and there are some limitations to that as well. So I looked at... Um, all of the participants that had been through STIRP programs, those that had successfully completed and those that hadn't, um, and at the four um, sites over a period of 16, 17, four years. And what we came up with was a number of 423. So it's a good sized number when it comes to research. Um, and we had the data um, for these men. Um, on average, when, when we were doing the research, what we found is that the, the men that come into the STIRP um, their average age at the start of treatment is 33 years of age, but that is skewed because the majority are quite young, under the age of 30. Um, there's an ethnicity breakdown there as well, with two-thirds of the population in the stoops being Māori, um, roughly a quarter Pākehā, um, under 10% Pacifica, and then that mysterious group of other um, we also gathered information on, on, the, on the offending that had been committed and also um, gang status. A lot of gang members coming through the stoop because it is targeting people who have what we call a rock roy score or a risk of reoffending violently. They get a score and they are the ones that are considered at the greatest risk. So that's anyone <coughs> 0.7 and above and their rock roy score will come and um, have the opportunity to, to do treatment. Perhaps, and it's a big perhaps. So. When we did the research, it's really important to kind of note that the results that we got really only apply to people that are come through the STIRP. So it's not like we can say this is true of the whole prison population because there's a significant number of people in prison who um, are there for crimes that might not be violent. And they might be repetitive um, or recidivist um, property offenders or things like that. So this is for violent offenders specifically. Um, and also, in order to actually go and do the STIRP, to actually meet the entry criteria to do a treatment programme, you already have, have to have ticked a few boxes um, to actually get there. So, for example, you have to have shown a period of behavioural stability within a prison environment of around um, at least six months. And you have to have a low-medium security status. Now, how do you get a low-medium security status? By behaving yourself in prison. You know, it's all based on how many incidences you've had, how many times you've sworn at the guards, how many times you've been in a fight. So in order to actually just get in the door, you already have to be having some ability to manage your behaviour in the prison. So again, our results can't say anything about um, prisoners who perhaps, who knows, this is total guesswork, have um, masses of amounts of trauma who actually don't get to manage their behaviour at all. We don't know. They sit in Paremoremo prison in the maximum security unit and they're released from that unit if and when they're released. So, so chances are um, chances are that, or we could hypothesise it, that the trauma or exposure to traumatic events numbers for them could be even higher still. So this is a specific group of men who have the opportunity... Yes, Ken. Uh, is that number up to an average of 67 previous convictions? It's a staggeringly high. It is staggeringly high. <laughs> so, well, perhaps I imagine, again, that's the average. Um, 
but then the average of previous convictions is very high as well. Although, you know, you can get one court conviction and have about five different... Oh, um, yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, there are quite a few of the individuals that will come through might be on a life sentence. Any other questions? Okay, so, so I was really, um, I was really intent upon being able to put some numbers though, because it was really hard to find numbers of how much um, exposure to adverse childhood experiences or childhood mal maltreatment there was. Um, is to try and start to get get an idea of how high this number is, because. Um, I have to say that having done treatment in a number of different places with people, I've never sat down with somebody and not and having perhaps over several sessions heard their story um, and know what they've done, I've never not been able to see the through line, you know, the way those things connect. Now they might not connect that way for everybody, but it makes some kind of crazy sense. As in it's not like completely out of the blue. And when it on the few occasions that it is, I have learned to stand back and say, Hmm, something's missing here. And inevitably it is. Over, over the course of time, you find out that for whatever reason, you didn't have the full picture of. Um, it always makes some kind of awful sense. So what we found in terms of types of maltreatment in the sample, um, and we used, is everyone familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences research? Fantastic. So this started in the States, I don't know how many years ago, 20 where they started to really put some numbers behind how these experiences that people can have in their early years really impacts a person over their life. And what they found was that the higher the types of maltreatment that you're, ex that you're exposed to as a child, the more likely you are to have not just mental health difficulties or difficulties with the law, but actually massive health disparities in terms of suffering from cancer, diabetes, everything, heart disease, you name it, the, high, the more exposure you had, the worse your physical health was likely to be, and of course, unsurprisingly, your mental health and, and your behaviour in the community as well. So what we found of the 400 and something or other men um, that, that we ran through the research is that only 3% had reported no experience of childhood adversity. Um, and you could say, well, we will say that... Um, 58% have experienced four or more different types of adversity. Like, this doesn't even take into account um, how long that adversity was, was experienced for, whether you had multiple types, just whether you had exposure to that particular, um, that particular type of adversity. We actually extended in this study from the um, ACEs at, um, to focus specifically on... Um, Physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, and psychological or emotional abuse, as Hedwig, Hedwig, was, Hedwig was saying before. Um, two different types of neglect. So we were looking at neglect of the necessities of life, roof over your head, regular meals. But then we were also looking at neglect as in, did, did you feel that somebody had their eye on you, that you were loved and valued in the home that you came from? So those were five of the things. Um, and then we added in, I think, witness to violence in the home and time spent on in state care, which seemed particularly important given the Royal Commission was going on and a huge number of um, men that were in the STU programs had spent time in state care. And it's not hard to see that time in state care, even in a, in a positive experience, as some people have positive experiences, it's still separation from a family. Um, it's still likely to have occurred in horrific kind of circumstances. So all of that, are, you know, is included as, as part of that traumatic experience. Um, so, so the thinking was, if a person scored really high on this um, measure of exposure to these awful experiences, then potentially that would make it more difficult for them, well, I've already said to even access the program, but for the ones that did get to access the program, it was likely that that would make it more difficult for them to complete the program, to see it through to its completion, to be considered treated, um, and it would also make it potentially that their progress was not um, it was not as sound as we would like it perhaps to be. 
if they did actually manage to get to the end. So those were the hypotheses. Would that be found to be true? And the way we measured it is we looked at two different things. Again, we're looking at data that already exists, so we had to make the, the best with what we had. Um, there's a, a personality measure. The Millen personality measure is what is given to all of the men that come into the STUs. And on that measure, there is um, a, a, a group of items that are measuring supposedly PTSD. Um, so we took the scores on the PTSD part of the Millen and, um, and we compared that with um, treatment completion and how people went through the program. And then we also took their, um, um, what do you call it? Not the ACEs score, but the amended kind of ACEs score, and 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 had a look to see the higher the number, did that mean you were less likely? Basically, was the hypothesis shown to be accurate? Um, and what we found was that there was a significant um, a significant impact of um, childhood maltreatment as measured by that ACEs type um, questionnaire on treatment on on whether they actually were able to complete treatment and how well they did in that, in that period of time, i.e. were they considered to have made some real substantial changes. Um, however, the PTSD symptoms, as measured by the Millen, um, didn't show a significant um, interaction there, and, and Hedwig will talk a little bit about, oh, in fact, she should probably talk very soon about um, at where they went from there. But those were the results. Um, for me, I was really pleased with the outcome because it kind of supported what, what I'd seen with my own eyes and also gave a really good... Um, ability to argue that we really need to start focusing. We can't just say mental health over here, offending needs over there, that actually if we could help people find ways of working with the ways trauma shows up in people's lives as an adult, then they would be more likely to be able to do the rehabilitation and therefore more likely to return to society with some chance of, of building a life worth living. So, yeah. Sorry. We actually did what Erica was hoping. We followed up uh, and uh, um, it, with a, um, a follow-up study that basically is um, using the same data set. Um, and Tiasha Kushrin, um, another master student, and then looked into uh, one other component. Um, we were wondering if any of those um, maladaptive personality traits that I mentioned earlier, if they would have an impact on this treatment completion um, uh, uh, outcome. And we found um, the only variable that actually had a slight uh, um, relationship with, with uh, treatment completion were psychopathic personality traits, but the other traits did not relate to it. And um, the same thing for treatment progress, they are even more so. That's basically the only predictor, significant predictor throughout all of those models was uh, childhood maltreatment. So... Um, what do we do or what do we need to do coming from this? And as Erica said, it points out this really, really strong relevance of to, to address this in some ways. So the first thing that comes to mind, so well, if people come in, coming in with into such a treatment program, highly selected, and they have this chance now, and, but we don't really want to make sure that they don't drop out and that they kind of are able to complete the program because if they drop out early, that is other research that has shown that actually has gives them a worse outcome long term if they would drop out. So what can we do to actually um, um, give them a better, better chance to um, um, succeed in the treatment? And so one thing we thought, well, we need to know earlier in the treatment program if they have such experiences to uh, address them early on and to provide potentially ad additional treatment for the traumatic experiences before they actually move into the treatment program that addresses the is um, uh, the violent offending in a, in a bigger group context. So what came from here was um, uh, a study, a project that um, one of our current students, Jacinta, is working on, um, to ask actually the men in the pre currently in the treatment uh, units who, ha who are partway through um, what they would actually uh, like or how they experience this process of being asked, uh, asked about tra traumatic experiences, what, what did it feel like for them coming in, getting asked by this Pakeha woman uh, younger than them, uh, um, what, what their childhood was like, um, so how it was for them and what they would, how they could imagine such a process to happen, how it would need to be um, in an early stage of the treatment to be asked about this so it can be addressed. So uh, Jacinta is currently working on figuring out what the main um, 
shared with us to um, then draw conclusions how that can be changed in the treatment units. And the plan is that uh, in one of the units uh, of the four across the country, there will be a change made to this process, and then we can compare it with another unit where that change hasn't been made to see if that has a better outcome for people who go through the, through the program. And um, in addition to that, asking for new uh, early experiences, um, I think what kind of what, what it points out and what, what I think, well, at least this, well, I'm probably an outside of, of, the, of Ara Potama, um, what is nice to see, it sparked and helped this development of seeing trauma to be an issue in the tr uh, prison system, not only for women. It has been longer for women and for its own right, but this is, that, this is actually a topic that needs to be addressed also in, in the main, um, I think that is coming through, and that's quite, um, quite good, and hopefully leads to more uh, provision of uh, support. Um, okay, so I think we have a couple of um, contact information here, uh, Erika's email address as well, some helplines. If you feel uh, now this was a little bit too much and you want to talk to somebody, please refer to those. Um, and now we are here for questions, so anything that you want to ask us and uh, hear more about. It. <laughs>